Within the first few millimeters of skin, of soft tissue below the skin line, there are several different ways we can use the ultrasound. Because we're using the high frequency transducer in these first few centimeters, we have beautiful image quality. This can help us different various tissue types, localize infectious processes and differentiate cellulitis from abscess formations, as well as localize foreign bodies and facilitate their removal. Now the different types of tissue we can see on the ultrasound in those first few centimeters, well we can see tendons, we can see muscle, joints, and the bones. Now there's soft and hard tissue. Most of the tissue is soft and that's from the skin line seen there with the epidermis down through the hypodermis or sometimes called the subcutaneous tissue. And then there's the subcutaneous fascia, which is that hyperechoic line. And then below that, we can see muscle. And finally, the bone, the bone being the hard tissue. It's very dense, it's very hyperechoic, and therefore it reflects the sound. Now there's this concept of anisotropy, and what happens when you have muscles and tendons depending on which angle you insinate them, you can have variations in their echogenicity. And as this uh, video demonstrates, the arrow points to the tendon. And along most portions of that tendon, the tendon is very quite hyperechoic, as we can see here in its linear striations. But as we get to the edge of this tendon where the angle of insonation may be different, it appears falsely hypoechoic right over here. And that's due to this factor called anisotropy. Now the tendons themselves should be readily identifiable on ultrasound because their, their connective tissue is so dense, it looks very hyperechoic, especially more hyperechoic than muscle. It exudes that fibrillar pattern and should be able to be evaluated throughout its constant range of motion. And if it's not present as you're ranging a joint, there may be an injury there. This is three different regions where we see some tendons. Here's a tendon along here. It exudes that anisotropy at, or this false hypoechoic area here. And it's very hyperechoic along here. Note the striations. We can see here in the short axis, this tendon appears uh, quite hyperechoic. And then we move it into the long axis, we can see those striations march across the screen again. Here's one in its range of motion. As the joint is ranged, we can see this tendon, very homogeneous, very hyperechoic as it's ranged along its tissue plane. Now, muscle is hypoechoic, and we can see within the muscle itself hyperechoic striae, as we can see here, in the long axis of the muscle. So when we line up that linear probe in the long axis of the muscle, we can see these hyperechoic striae going across, and in between the different muscle bundles, we can see hyperechoic connective tissue surrounding them. So this is one muscle bundle over here with its hyperechoic connective tissue seen superiorly. And then we can see differentiating this muscle from this muscle down here is another hyperechoic connective tissue. When we move into the short axis, these hyperechoic areas now become more fibrillated or more punctate on their axis, seen in their short axis. And the bone too now instead of stretching out across the screen is seen in its radial pattern here. Very dense. Some more examples of bone we can see as the sound penetrates through the subcutaneous tissue, through the muscle, and eventually gets to the bone. It's a very hyperechoic structure of the bone because it's so dense and behind it is a shadow because the sound reflects off the bone. We can see the bone over here 
and we can also make out the bone as it goes along here. This, in all these projections on this screen here, this is the long axis of the bone. <clears throat> when the bone has a fracture in it, we can see a step off. So here's one bony fragment here, a step off, and then another bony fragment here. We can see this up here as well. Here's a bony fragment coming along, step off, and then another bony fragment going this way. In this particular patient, we can also make out the anisotropy seen on this area right here of its tendon, appearing falsely hypoechoic compared to this tendon portion and this tendon portion here. We would expect the tendon to continue to be hyperechoic, however, because of anisotropy, we see it's hypoechoic here. And then down here with the clavicle fracture, one part of the clavicle is here, there's a step off, and then another part of the clavicle is seen down there. <coughs> when we get to the joints, <coughs> because one bone comes up to another bone, it appears, <laughs> you can see these very soft um, bony ends coming along here, and then another bony end coming along here. And this is what we call the seagull sign. It looks like the wings of a seagull at the, at the joint spaces. It's a potential space. This area here is where this bone comes in contact with this bone. So this would be the articular surface of these bones here. And in between these two articular surfaces is a joint space. In this case, the patient does not have any fluid in the joint space. Should they have joints, fluid in the joint space, it's easy to compress that area to demonstrate it. When it comes to abscesses and differentiating them from cellulitis, there has been some work done on this process. One study titled Abscess, Applied Bedside Sonography for the Convenient Evaluation of Superficial Soft Tissue infect Infections was prospective and enrolled 107 patients. They forced the clinicians to answer yes or no before and after the ultrasound of whether or not they thought there was an abscess there. The clinical exam uh, seen here shows uh, poor test characteristics, yet, but for ultrasound, the test characteristics were much better. In fact, there was 18 cases in which ultrasound disagreed with the clinical exam, and the ultrasound was correct in 17 of those 18 cases with a significant p-value. So if you look at this picture here, this guy came in, and he has many scars on his arm consistent with the signs of chronic IV drug use. The patient himself thought he had an abscess in this area that is red uh, and indurated here. Now, prior to using ultrasound, one would have likely explored the area in question surgically, however, unnecessarily, since this patient only had the signs of cellulitis demonstrated on ultrasound and there's no actual abscess. <coughs> Here's this patient's arm in question. We can see prominent cobblestoning uh, going on there. And this is consistent with cellulitis and not abscess. Notice the hyperechoic areas of um, inflamed uh, soft tissue seen here with hypo or even anechoic uh, areas between them. These islands of hyperechoic areas are referred to as cobblestoning of cellulitis. Sometimes this is also seen in patients who simply have edema, but there's no abscess demonstrated here. Here's another example of prominent cobblestoning. We can see uh, very hyperechoic areas outlined by the hypo or even anechoic uh, edema seen between the uh, areas that clearly demonstrate cellulitis. Now, this on the other hand is what an abscess looks like. Notice we compress the tissue and we can see this hypochoic debris swirling uh, and layering out uh, in this area. Adjacent to the abscess, we do see signs um, many times around the abscess of, of combined cellulitis or some cobblestoning, but here this is all clearly abscess material seen with its hypochoic debris. And when we compress the abscess uh, in question, we can see that the debris swirls with uh, each time we compress the skin with the transducer. So the linear transducer is here. This is the skin line, and we can see just underneath um, the skin there is this abscess that as we compress it, it swirls, and it goes off in this other direction, and it even communicates over here, this other direction over here, 
and uh, not shown here on this video is an extensive uh, network of abscesses that actually required surgical drainage in the operating room. Just another example of what an abscess looks like is this hypocote debris seen and in between those abscess areas sometimes it's possible to make out the a little bit of cobblestoning of cellulitis but this is all what pus looks like uh, down here under the uh, ultrasound. And the patient clearly has a very prominent abscess. And sometimes we can see a little bit more inflamed hyperchoic tissue that is consistent with the overlying cellulitis. This is another example here of a very superficial uh, abscess uh, that uh, when we compress it, maybe there's some swirling of uh, debris here, but all this hypochoic area here is uh, very consistent with abscess material. And uh, this patient has multiple little abscesses along here, right adjacent to this vascular structure uh, when we apply the color flow Doppler. Um, and so this was a very tricky one. We wanted to drain it, but, but stay clear away from the vascularity uh, and just get into the abscess only. And we can see this network of abscesses here as they're going along and with uh, various areas of vascularity that we're trying to stay away from. And ultrasound is good because it helps us really focus ourselves on staying with the compartment of the abscess and not getting into the vessels. This patient has a very, very small abscess. This was one, this is actually uh, their eyelid coming along here. And this is a lacrimal gland, which normally it is not seen to this uh, degree. And this patient had a very swollen eyelid. And we can make out that small amount of uh, abscess here with a little pus inside of it there. And uh, this required just a, just a quick lancing in order to drain this abscess. It's another example of a gluteal fold abscess. In this case, the linear probe really wasn't doing us uh, any help. So we switched over and used the C60 or the curved transducer here. And on this patient, we can make out this very prominent uh, hypochoic debris in their, uh, just in their gluteal fold, superior gluteal fold. And this, believe it or not, was not at all uh, palpated on the physical exam. There was no overlying erythema. The patient simply complained of um, pain every time he sits down on his tailbone area. And uh, we weren't thinking much of it because there was really no tenor, um, there was no uh, overlying erythema of the skin. However, the guy was very, very tender. So we went ahead and looked first with the linear probe, couldn't see anything. We moved to the C60 in that gluteal fold was that was the thing to do. We could see this large abscess down here that was later confirmed on CT scan. Just another example of guiding a needle down to an abscess to uh, confirm, on, on the one hand, confirm that there is actually a pus coming out of there, um, and it's not just a seroma or another type of fluid collection, and also to, uh, in some centers, they treat abscesses by uh, needle aspiration rather than an open drainage procedure and if they're small enough and that's just what's happening here just ultrasound guided needle um, abscess drainage and finally some things look like abscess but they're just hematomas and that's what this looks like here this is in the patient's calf this is uh, muscle we see up here and uh, this very hypochoic area uh, with some anechoic areas to it this is what a calf hematoma looks like it's all spreading out back here and, uh, and on the patient's skin, too, there's prominent ecchymoses seen as well. And this is an example here of a patient who has an abscess actually on their finger. And um, the finger, obviously, very superficial structure. This is the bone of the finger down here. We can see in this subcutaneous soft tissue area right here, there's a prominent hypochoic um, debris seen. And uh, in this area right here is where um, we can make out that abscess. Now, sometimes the, um, the structure is so close to the surface of the skin um, that it's hard to see. And, and actually, we need to stand off a ways from uh, a, 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 um, a body part. And so what we see here is using the high-frequency linear transducer, we have a couple of options on a very superficial structure. We can dump, we can dunk 
the uh, the hand or the body part here seen in the water, and uh, and that's very helpful because it also if you use cold water it helps with pain control, and you no longer have to press the transducer actually right onto the the painful digit. We can stand away from it, and also you could use a um, a standoff pad uh, such as the one you see here. Uh, there are commercially available standoff pads where you just place the probe on top of the standoff pad and you place the standoff pad on the on the area of, of interest and uh, it, it basically sometimes what happens is the 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 focal the natural focal point of the transducer is just uh, too far away from um, it's, it's deeper than where we're trying to insinate so this happens with very superficial structures uh, such as on the finger as we just saw the other thing um, that you want to think about doing whenever you're doing um, any musculoskeletal type of ultrasound, it's always helpful to use either another digit or the opposite um, limb for comparison studies. And, um, and what you're going to notice here is that it's a very dynamic exam, that, that whenever you examine any uh, musculoskeletal structure, you can, range, you can do range of motion and do uh, what we call kinetic examination of a digit or um, any musculoskeletal structure. This is what a uh, water bath looks like here for objects that are too close to the natural focal point of the transducer. Um, this is just the uh, the palmar surface here of the finger and, um, and we can see that there's a little all these all these specular reflectors here, these hyperchoic sort of um, snowstorm that we see in here. Uh, that, that's air in the water, and that's what it looks like when it hasn't settled out of the uh, water yet. A little bit of air still in this, in this, in this water bath. And uh, yeah, so this is the, flex, the flexor surface of the finger, and as we stand away from it a little bit, uh, we I can, actually can see uh, very good um, sonography of the entire surface. In other words, some places are hard to get gel, some of the little nooks and crannies here, it's hard to get gel into, but when we can submerge something in water, the water fills in all those gaps, and we have very good uh, visibility of all these uh, uh, articular surfaces. This is a, uh, another example of a finger, uh, and now with the water bath, we stand away from this finger a little bit, and we can see this patient has an has a, uh, abscess here in the distal tip of their finger and see it quite well with the ultrasounds. The patient's uh, moving their finger, we can see it. Uh, this happens to be the thumb, and uh, we can see this area of this hypochoic debris seen in here uh, within that uh, the uh, pulpy area of the thumb. Much easier to see with, when using the, um, the uh, water bath. Just another example of another um, a digit with this. This one has a perinechia. And so it's uh, the uh, other aspect of the finger, and we can see that this area up here, when it's in the water, this is all water that's filling in this area here, we can make out this little perinechial area um, with the, here it is in the short axis, we see this uh, area here that's hypochoic in the short axis, and then once we move into the long axis, we are on the long axis, and uh, we can see this area all under here, just right up to the nail. There's the nail bed right in there, and then the perinechia that's adjacent to it. And um, this is an example of somebody who has uh, a large hemorrhagic bulli on their foot that was dunked in a water uh, bath mixture. And this is the 2D uh, image of that structure here. We're fanning through that. All this um, meniscus that you see there, that's all the, uh, the hemorrhagic material. We get very good visualization in the two-dimensional mode, and we move into the three-dimensional mode where we can um, the machine captures the images as we fan through them and then reconstructs a three-dimensional image that we can uh, tumble around and really see the depth, how well, it, how what the depth is, and get a good visualization of this entire structure seen there in three dimensions as we tumble it around. Though the 2D image does really most of the work, and we're able to see a very nice meniscal layer as we fan through this uh, person's hemorrhagic bulli here we do see a very prominent uh, sort of uh, meniscal layer there uh, that is actually very well captured on the uh, on the 2D image. This is in the um, 
peritonsillar region and um, there is a transducer that we can use in order to get to that peritonsillar area and that's the uh, the endovaginal transducer of course we're careful not to call it an endovaginal transducer um, in front of the patient because uh, sometimes the patient uh, is reluctant to insert the transducer into their mouth uh, but we can see here this is the footprint of the transducer it's right up against the posterior pharynx uh, I usually give the patient a milligram of Versed and some hurricane spray in the back of the throat and then we can guide the needle actually right down to the abscess so ultrasound is good for uh, not just confirmation of the uh, peritonsillar abscess but also guidance of the needle to the abscess to assist in the drainage now um, one of the things you want to do with this transducer though is definitely uh, keep it covered um, keep it uh, so that it um, keeps clean in the uh, posterior oral pharynx and there are uh, several ways to do that one way is simply using a condom and one of the other things that we can see sometimes we expect to see a peritonsillar abscess instead are just very prominent lymph nodes and uh, this is patients got just a lot of parapharyngeal lymphadenopathy going on in the back of their throat as they swallow we can see how these lymph nodes sort of come together um, here the patient's going to swallow right there they kind of move towards each other uh, and in the uh, coronal plane here uh, in other words the, the the we're getting a short axis of the back of the throat as we fan superiorly we can see both lymph nodes on one particular view now if I went to a sagittal plane with the indicator aimed towards uh, the the uh, roof of the mouth then I would have to fan to one tonsil or the other to see them but on this transverse plane or coronal plane we can see them both at the same time so these are just pharyngeal lymph nodes and another way to confirm we're looking at a lymph node is that you can apply power flow Doppler to it and it will light up uh, on the screen quite prominently when they are inflamed they become uh, hyper engorged hypervascular and if you're still thinking you might be looking at an abscess certainly an abscess wouldn't have this amount of vascularity to it and this is a nice way to differentiate between um, an abscess and a hyperemic lymph node this is a, a very large peritonsillar abscess um, we see over here that uh, these these are 0.5 centimeter hash marks so 0.51 1.52, 2.53, a little bit more gives us to 3.2 for the depth. And so we're, this is measuring, you know, anywhere from, you know, this mark all the way down to, this is about a 1.5, almost a 2 centimeter in its longest axis uh, diameter peritonsillar abscess. You think about that, it's very, it's a very large one here, very prominent. And this is the intracavitary transducer we have in the mouth. And we can see that it's very prominent peritonsillar abscess here. One of the other interesting findings is when we apply um, color Doppler back here, we can actually make out that there are some blood vessels back here that we want to stay away from when uh, performing the procedure. So in this case, this is the posterior pharynx here. The distance the needle would have to travel is just over a centimeter in order to get into the um, space that is the peritonsillar abscess so uh, we have an idea of how far we need to go when we'll start to see some pus come back now as the video plays itself we can see now that this complete almost complete resolution of this peritonsillar abscess this is post uh, in, incision and drainage and uh, it's, it's essentially gone so it's a nice way ultrasound is to diagnosis uh, you can perform the procedure under its guidance and confirm that you have officially ended the procedure as well. Here's an example here of how far they're going to need to uh, insert the needle in order to get to some pus and this time it's 7.8 millimeters from the back of the throat down to where the, just the abscess should start. I'd, I'd go at least a centimeter though to get into this uh, abscess and staying away from these uh, vascular structures here that are adjacent to the peritonsillar abscess. And this is a large peritonsillar abscess. We can see it extending all the way down here. As we compress the back of the throat, we can see this is all pus. As it, as it kind of moves, as we compress it, it uh, swirls around a little bit. 
and this is a, a, a very uh, helpful uh, being able to see that this very large amount of pus and this, this very severe degree of a peritonsillar abscess, you may find that some of these are so large that uh, they're very uh, easy to drain or that they're so extensive that they may have, um, they may need to be actually drained in the operating room for maximum comfort and securing of the airway. However, ultrasound does help to differentiate how difficult or uh, easy a drainage uh, procedure could be. And we can localize the needle. Here comes uh, the needle as it's coming underneath the, uh, the transducer. I like to have the needle come in underneath the long axis of the sound so I can see uh, the entire, uh, not just the needle tip, but also the needle shaft, and uh, which is not going on here. They're probably going under the short axis of the probe. And they instill some lidocaine. That's what that little blush was there, and uh, a little more lidocaine. And then uh, they will start to drain the contents out through the needle, and, uh, and, um, and then the video clip ends. Foreign bodies can be often challenging to find their location and their cause. In fact, of patients who present with painful swelling in their soft tissue, only 25% will find out what the cause is. Usually physicians turn to um, x-rays to identify the underlying cause of patients who come in with swelling. Um, unfortunately, this is often unproductive since a lot of times it's a wooden form body that's causing uh, the swelling and wood does not show up very well, uh, if at all, on an x-ray. And it turns out that missing uh, missed form bodies have been reported to be the second leading cause of litigation against physicians who practice emergency medicine. Now, with uh, metallic and glass, x-rays can be used to demonstrate their location, uh, but uh, ultrasound is actually much better to precisely remove them um, at the bedside. So just seeing a, um, a plain film, uh, even a two-view plain film, it can be very misleading about where to actually search for the foreign body as uh, one is often misled by looking at uh, an injury, uh, a soft tissue surface injury, which may not be anywhere near where the foreign body is actually located. Now, CT and MRI can also both be used. However, um, we're talking about cost, and in the case of CT, the uh, unnecessary radiation, and in the case of MRI, sometimes not always available, and actually, um, they have lower accuracy in the doing the actual surgical removal part. Well, what about ultrasound? Shields reported that ultrasound has an overall accuracy of 92%, for documenting wooden form bodies as small as 2.5 millimeters. Uh, Jacobson looked at form bodies as small as 5 millimeters. So even in these very small structures, uh, they can be seen um, on ultrasound. And then uh, Hill uh, looked at this in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, had 80 cases of patients who came in, uh, and uh, 53 of them had form bodies. In fact, Ultrasound was able to detect 44 of the 53 foreign bodies um, with 83% uh, sensitivity. And these were operators who described themselves as inexperienced. And not surprisingly, wood had very high sensitivity. Plastic, in this case, had 73% of sensitivity. And uh, this was a case here of a patient who came in who said they fell on an outstretched hand onto a toothpick. And this was the site of entry of the toothpick. Uh, and with ultrasound, the toothpick was actually located way over here. And before using ultrasound, um, if I was even able to see a toothpick on x-ray, I would have really been lured into, you know, opening up this area, searching around for a foreign body. However, the ultrasound is very successful in localizing it where it needed to be, which was where the toothpick wound up. This is what it looked like on ultrasound. This is a bone in the hand. Uh, one of the metacarpal bones, and uh, over here uh, we can see the toothpick. It's outlined by uh, the two stars, and with these foreign bodies, it's important to inject a lidocaine uh, into and around the foreign body uh, for three reasons. Uh, number one, that helps to visualize the foreign body because ultrasound loves fluid so much. It's, it's enable, it enables it to 
to visualize the actual foreign body better. Number two, it helps to unroof it to make it easier to, to remove. And then number three, there is the analgesic part of the lidocaine that uh, makes it more comfortable for the patient. Now this is a needle that was in uh, someone's leg. Uh, very clearly shows the reverberation artifact, these equidistant lines that come down towards the bottom of the screen. Needles do that. Uh, when initially it was not known what axis the needle was in, and by ultrasound we're able to see this is the long axis of the needle here, and we're able to see the exact plane of tissue that it, it was in. Very superficial here. Um, these are these are 0.5 centimeter hash marks, and um, this patient, we could see this um, needle about 0.5 uh, centimeters, or about uh, actually about four millimeters below the skin line, and uh, this was a standoff pad being used up here, and so uh, very superficial, and we could see the long axis of the needle, the exact plane that the needle was in underneath the skin line. This was just another example of what wood looks like on ultrasound. We can see this long structure here. We got it in its long axis, uh, very hyperechoic uh, on ultrasound, quite easy to see this toothpick. And this is also using a standoff pad in a, in a uh, actually this patient had their finger in a uh, bucket of water and we could see the actual Wood. This was a plant material here um, that uh, that is seen just penetrating below the skin line and making its way into the subcutaneous tissue here. Another example of a wood form body, very hyperechoic, and uh, just measuring its length and its two axes here. The next step would certainly be to inject lidocaine all around this form body, so it's easier to take out and so it's easier to see. And when a foreign body's been there for a while, there starts to be a buildup of inflammation. Three to five days out, you can see as much of this inflammation or this hypoechoic rim here around uh, this particular uh, woody foreign body here. And this hypoechoic area also helps to visualize it. Um, place another foreign body to find the foreign body. In this case, we take a needle uh, down to this uh, glass. So here's a needle coming in here. It reaches where the glass is. And then at that point, we can use that needle as uh, a marker for where to place the uh, device to grab the foreign body. This is uh, just a tissue model here demonstrating this. Here's the needle that comes down to the glass. And then um, the uh, device to grasp the glass comes down uh, over here and basically you reach these two things come together and that's where the uh, the foreign body in this case glass is so one needle can be useful for that um, and when you're opening and closing a grasping device this is how it can look underneath uh, the skin on ultrasound we see this these white dots that we see everywhere that's the air that's in the track that the grasper uh, basically created. So as the as the grasper goes through the soft tissue, it creates a little air track, and that's what all these little white dots are here. And sometimes it's necessary to actually use two needles to localize the foreign body. And uh, these two needles, when underneath the long axis of the sound, um, if we can take one needle and then take another one, and in this case we're pulling out a piece of wood, this is a toothpick here, um, and that can help localize the grasper even better. And this is the example here of what uh, this looks like. We took one tooth, one needle here coming across, another needle coming here, and this is the actual grasper here with this reverberation artifact um, grabbing the, um, the wooden toothpick. So these two needles can localize the location which to put the grasper. This is a, an example here of the needle coming in and coming in contact with the foreign body. We can see as this clip keeps replaying itself, once the needle makes contact, this whole foreign body shifts just slightly. And this is helpful because once we get the needle down to where the foreign body is, particularly if it's a very deep foreign body, we can then pass a guide wire through the needle and then take the needle out of the tissue. And then we can blunt dissect down the edge of the guide wire in order to get down to the foreign body. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. This patient had a needle break off in their buttocks. 
during uh, an immunization uh, years ago, and they came in because it was um, particularly discomforting um, uh, on that particular day. And when they arrived, we took a look with ultrasound and found this needle uh, about uh, two centimeters. Uh, these are one centimeter hash marks. So we get down to about two centimeters below the skin line, and we guided a needle down to the foreign object, placed a guide wire through the needle, and then we removed the needle, and then we did blunt dissection down the edge of the guide wire with our grasper until we were able to come in contact with it, in which case we extracted the foreign body.